Welcome. Welcome to my workshop. I'm Jim. Today I want to share with you what I've learned about the sine and cosine functions. Let's begin with an arbitrary circle. It's convenient to draw horizontal and vertical lines through the center of the circle so that we know exactly where it is. This circle has a diameter of 22 inches, which is the same as saying that its radius is 11 inches. I've chosen to use an unusual value for a reason. This radius is not one foot or one meter or one unit length. It's not one of anything. This is simply an arbitrary circle. I've added a protractor. It has a nice gold handle so we can push it easily around the circle. Like all protractors, this one measures angles. Right now, it's set to 35 degrees. When the protractor moves, the angle is continuously updated. Here, I'm moving it up to 50 degrees. Note that I'm measuring angles up from the right-hand side of the horizontal line and assuming that a positive angle corresponds to a rotation in the counterclockwise direction. Don't forget that 360 degrees corresponds to one complete revolution around the circle. Now let's consider an arbitrary point somewhere on the circle, like this point marked with a black dot. I want to measure the vertical distance from the horizontal axis up to this point, as shown by the blue arrow. To measure this distance, we'll need a ruler. I think this carpenter's square will do nicely. I'll attach it to the horizontal axis. The perpendicular foot will keep the ruler aligned with the horizontal, which will ensure that it measures the correct vertical distance. I will now slide the carpenter's square to the left so that it's aligned with the highlighted point. I'll highlight in blue the vertical distance along the edge of the carpenter's square. In addition, I'll add a dimension arrow to show the distance in inches. There we go. The vertical distance to the highlighted point is 6.272 inches. I will now pull the protractor back down so that it goes through the center of the highlighted point. I'm now going to divide the vertical distance, which is 6.272 inches, by the radius, which is 11 inches. Note that the colors of the numbers match their corresponding distances on the wheel. The quotient of the division is 0 0.570. This number is called the sine of 34.762 degrees. This is the very same sine that you learned about when you studied geometry. The heavy black triangle is a right triangle, which means that it contains a 90 degree angle. The sine of angle A is the length of the opposite side, which I've drawn in blue, divided by the length of the hypotenuse, which I've shown in red. I'm now going to synchronize the ruler and the protractor so that they move in tandem whenever a new point is selected. In addition, I'll cause the sine calculation to be updated continuously as they move. We're ready now to go to work and to make some measurements. There are going to be a lot of measurements and a lot of divisions, and the results can be understood most easily if we plot them. So, I've drawn a graph. The vertical axis goes from 0 up to 1. The horizontal axis goes from 0 degrees out to 90 degrees. To plot the value of sine for 20 degrees, go out along the horizontal axis as far as 20 degrees, and then go up to 0 0.342. The dot marks the spot. I'll now increase the angle of the protractor up to 85 degrees, plotting the values of sine on the graph as we go along. As we get closer and closer to 90 degrees, the vertical distance gets closer and closer to the radius, so their division gets closer and closer to 1. In other words, the value of the sine function is going to be exactly equal to 1 as soon as we get to exactly 90 degrees. Let's run the protractor over to 95 degrees. Nothing bad happens, so we can keep going but we're going to need some extra room on the horizontal axis of the graph, which I'll now extend out as far as 180 degrees. Now we can push the protractor some more. I'll take it all the way down to 175 degrees, stopping just short of the wheel's horizontal center line. Let's gingerly put our toe across the horizontal to see what happens. The value of the sine function turns negative. What happens is this. 
Up until now, we've been measuring the vertical distance in the direction up from the horizontal line. Once we get past 180 degrees, the vertical distance has to be measured down in the minus direction. The radius will stay at 11 inches, but the division will now give a negative result. It's clear that we're now going to need longer axes on the graph, both along the horizontal to measure degrees greater than 180, and also along the vertical to measure negative values of sine. Let me do a bit of stretching. Now, let's continue. I will take the protractor all the way around the wheel, stopping at 350 degrees, just short of a full revolution. We don't experience any trouble when going through 270 degrees while the protractor is straight down, since the vertical distance remains negative as we go through. Let's push on through 360 degrees and into a second circumnavigation of the wheel. Notice that we're retracing the same steps we took before. All the angles are now 360 degrees bigger than they were during the first time around, but the values of the sine function are the same. We can even continue into a third revolution. In fact, we could go on indefinitely. There are all kinds of consistencies and regularities built into the sine function. For example, the value of sine for any angle is the same as the value 360 degrees later or 360 degrees before. This happens because the carpenter's square is located at exactly the same spot on the wheel every 360 degrees of revolution. When you start from the horizontal line through the wheel and go either clockwise or counterclockwise, the values of sine pass through the same values, but one is positive and the other negative. On the other hand, when you start from the vertical line through the wheel and go either clockwise or counterclockwise, the values of sine are the same either way. Let's apply this knowledge. Recall that we plotted the sine function starting at an angle of 20 degrees right here. That means that the plot does not include the curve from 0 degrees here up to 20 degrees. We can fill in the missing part by copying it from a similar part anywhere else. For example, 720 degrees is exactly two revolutions around the wheel. The 20 degree piece from 720 degrees to 740 degrees will be exactly the same as the part we're missing. Let's simply drag a copy of this piece over. There, we've got it. I'm going to reset the apparatus to zero degrees. And now I'm going to run it backwards, which is to say I'm going to turn the protractor clockwise. This will take us into negative angles, where the minus sign simply means that the rotation to get us there was in the clockwise direction rather than the counterclockwise direction which took us through positive angles. Now let's put the sine function aside for a minute and talk about the cosine function. The sine function was based on measuring distances up from the horizontal line which passes through the wheel's center. The cosine function uses distances measured to the right of the vertical line through the center. I've turned the carpenter's square around so that it now slides up and down along the vertical line and measures this horizontal distance. The distance being measured is now drawn in green. The cosine function is this horizontal distance divided by the radius. Observe that this is the same definition of cosine that's used in classical geometry. To get the cosine of this angle A, note that this angle A is exactly the same. It's an interior angle of this right triangle highlighted in black. The cosine is the quotient obtained by dividing the adjacent side, shown in green, by the hypotenuse in red. I'm going to plot the values for the cosine function on the same graph as before. This point on the graph marks the protractor's current position at an angle of minus 370 degrees, at which the value of cosine is 0 0.985. I'm going to make three counterclockwise circumnavigations around the wheel. I'll stop when the angle reaches 730 degrees. It's apparent that the cosine is very similar to the sine. In fact, the cosine function is exactly the same as the sine function, but shifted 90 degrees to the left. This means that the value of cosine for any arbitrary angle x is equal to the value of sine at that angle, plus 90 degrees. What's the use of sine and cosine in electronics? 
There are a million uses for sine and cosine in geometry. We encounter it all the time in everyday life, where they help us derive distances and directions. In physics, sine and cosine help understand anything to do with circular motion. In electronics, that's us, sine and cosine are essential for decomposing and processing waveforms. Let's work through an example of how to use cosine waves. I've recorded a few seconds of the dial tone from my landline. I opened the sound file using a program called Audacity. The waveform looks like a typical audio signal. Here's what it sounds like. I'll zoom in to show that there's a lot more regularity at this scale. There's plenty of noise, too, which I've marked with red arrows. This noise happened because I made the recording simply by holding the handset up to the microphone. The horizontal axis covers the period of time from 1.48 seconds to 1.52 seconds. That's a duration of 0.04 seconds, or 40 milliseconds. To understand the dial tone, I've begun by plotting a short period of a particular cosine wave. This one has an amplitude of 50 millivolts and oscillates at a frequency of 350 hertz. The horizontal axis is time. Time zero is right in the middle. The time axis stretches from minus 0.005 seconds on the left out to positive 0.005 seconds on the right. That's a total duration of 0.01 seconds, or 10 milliseconds. The vertical axis is the voltage. The cosine has a peak voltage of 0.05 volts, or 50 millivolts. Its peak negative voltage is minus 0.05 volts, or minus 50 millivolts. The equation for this curve will have this form. 0.05 multiplied by the cosine of something. As the cosine term alternates between minus 1 and plus 1, it will be multiplied by 0.05 to produce a result that varies between minus 50 millivolts and plus 50 millivolts. That takes care of the amplitude. We now have to find some way to set the frequency. A good place to start is to make the argument of the cosine function equal to some fraction multiplied by 360 degrees. Of course, we're going to have to figure out what this fraction should be. The fraction is going to have to depend on time, since we want the waveform to vary as time changes. The dashed blue line identifies time zero. We want the fraction to be equal to zero here. Zero multiplied by 360 degrees is zero degrees, and the cosine function at zero degrees has the value of one. The black dot represents the value at time zero. This suggests that we should set the fraction equal to time multiplied by some other fraction, g. When time is zero, we will be at the black dot. When time increases from zero, we will move to the right on the graph. On the other hand, when time decreases below zero, we will move to the left. We can determine what fraction g ought to be by looking at the first full cycle of the waveform. The first cycle ends when the black dot moves over to here. This is the period of the wave. And, as it happens, we know what it is. The period is the reciprocal of the frequency. I said this was a 350 hertz signal. So the period is equal to 1 divided by 350 cycles per second, which is equal to 0.002857 seconds per cycle. We want to set fraction g so that as time progresses from 0 up to 0 0.002857 seconds, the argument of the cosine goes from 0 to 360 degrees. Here's how we do it. We set fraction g equal to 1 divided by the period. This gives us the following equation for the specified waveform. It alternates sinusoidally with an amplitude of 50 millivolts, and it has a period of 0 0.002857 seconds, which is equivalent to a frequency of 350 hertz. We need a second cosine wave as well. This one has the same 50 millivolt amplitude as the first one, but has a slightly higher frequency, 440 hertz. 
A higher frequency corresponds to a shorter period. The period is equal to 1 divided by the frequency, which in this case is 0.002273 seconds. The period is the length of time between any corresponding points on the waveform, such as the length of time between troughs. So the cosine function is going to look like this, with an argument which is some fraction multiplied by 360 degrees. The fraction is the time in seconds divided by the period. At time zero, the fraction is equal to zero, and the value of the cosine function will be one. As time passes through the values from zero up to the period, 0.002273 seconds, this fraction will increase from zero to one. The argument of the cosine function will therefore increase from zero up to 360 degrees, and the value of the function will pass through one complete cycle. The amplitude of the cosine function is set to 0.05, the same as before, so that the waveform will cycle between minus 50 millivolts and plus 50 millivolts. We've just worked through two cosine waveforms, and I'm showing them here one on top of the other. The red curve is the 350 hertz function we looked at first. The blue curve is the 440 hertz one we just finished. I'm now going to add the values of the two curves to make up a third one. For example, at time zero, both component waveforms are 50 millivolts, so the sum will be 100 millivolts. At certain times, when the red curve has the value zero, the sum will be equal to the value of the blue curve. The blue dots show an example of a time when this is the case. At other times, when the blue curve has the value zero, the sum will be equal to the value of the red curve. The red dots show an example of a time when this is the case. After adding up the values for all of the times across the horizontal axis, the result is this black curve. Like the earlier graphs, this one covers a period of time which is 10 milliseconds long. It stretches from minus 0.005 seconds on the left to plus 0.005 seconds on the right. I'd like to show what the curve looks like over a longer period of time. Say, for the 40 millisecond period, stretching from minus 20 milliseconds to plus 20 milliseconds. This is the same set of the three curves, just shown over a longer period of time. Here, I've redrawn the curve, which is the sum of the two components, all by itself. Compare it to the recorded sound of my telephone's dial tone, which we looked at a few moments ago. They're the same. The dial tone used by the telephone networks in North America is the sum of two sinusoidal waves at 350 hertz and 440 hertz. The dial tone is an example of a DTMF signal. DTMF stands for Dual Tone Multiple Frequency. It's a concept that's widely used in the telephone system. Each of the numbers on your telephone's keypad has its own tone, and each tone is the sum of cosine waves at two frequencies. In this table, I've shown the frequencies for the first few numbers on the keypad. Each row on the keypad has a distinct pitch. For example, the frequency of the first row is 697 hertz. Each column also has its own distinct pitch. The first column's frequency is 1209 hertz. There's a separate schedule of frequency for call progress tones. Call progress tones are the signals which you hear at different stages of the process through which a telephone call proceeds. The dial tone is one, as are the busy signal and the ring back signal you hear when the phone on the other end is ringing. There are others too, for call waiting and so on. Each one is the sum of cosine waves at two frequencies, as shown. We've just scratched the surface of sine and cosine. There's Fourier analysis, oscillators, waveguides, Lissajou figures, modulation, filters, antennas, and lots more, all of which are firmly based on sine and cosine. But we'll leave them for another day. Thanks for watching. See you next time.